welcome to the latest episode of Tech uh, Salescast with me, James Hounslow. Uh, and today I'm really excited because we've got Wendy Harris uh, from Gong. Uh, good morning, Wendy. How are you doing? Morning. I'm good. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so we wanted to get uh, Wendy on as part of the series where we've been looking at sales enablement um, platforms based on the the huge amount of hiring that's been going on um, over the last 12, 18 months of salespeople. Uh, we've had Jiminy on, Mind Tickle, Aligned, a really cool startup uh, from Israel as well, Unifor, Cluster, and uh, now, I know we've been waiting a little while, but uh, Gong was uh, was especially one of the uh, the businesses that I wanted to um, to get on and to talk all about sales enablement. Um, so I've learned a lot over the summer. I think we're going to learn a lot more now uh, with Wendy. But as a way of getting started, Wendy, you'll probably do a much better job. Do you want to just give us a uh, a little overview of uh, your career so far up until arriving at um, where you are? Absolutely, yeah. So. Um... So I studied business and French in Trinity College in Dublin and spent a year in France as part of that. And I had no idea what I wanted to do um, thereafter, but I went to all these milk round things that they do at colleges. And I saw, I went to one with my friend for Goldman Sachs and I watched a video of the trading floor um, and I was totally hooked. And so 32 interviews later, I started <laughs> interviewing in October of uh of one year and finished in March the following year and um, they offered me a job and I spent 11 years there so I worked in London and in Chicago as a trader uh, sales trader and um, I absolutely loved it It was a great first start in, in life and then I really really wanted to move back to Dublin and you know I, I didn't want to work in finance in Dublin um, I wanted to transition into tech it was incredibly hard to do that you know, there's uh, the try, trying to get your foot in the door in technology when you don't have any uh, experience in it is, is hard. And so, uh, but I eventually did. I took a job at Facebook, earning very, uh, a lot less than I used to on a contract in marketing. Um, and then um, uh, left there to run uh, UK Ireland mid-market sales at AdRoll, which is a retargeting firm. And then went on to Dropbox, where I started running UK Ireland sales and then ran European sales. Uh, and then I was hired uh, as a VP of MIA for CarGurus, and I joined uh, Gong a year ago. Um, so uh, June a year ago as the first person on the ground in EMEA, which was uh, pretty exciting. And we are now yeah. at 65 people hired. So it's been a wild ride. Wow. Um, lots to dig into. The bit um, that I would really like to, to understand, I've, I've spoken to a few sales leaders who started out in investment banking world. The, the bit that I, that I kind of see is that um, the structured process that you need in that world, um, along with a, a work ethic. How important do you think that is and how much value does that add to you uh, coming into the technology world, sales mm. world? Well, I think there's some core traits that I, I would never have been successful in Goldman Sachs for over a decade if mm. I didn't have core traits that were transferable. So work ethic, you mentioned, I started work at 6 a.m. for 11 years. So I was up at 4.30 in the morning for 11 years. and. Uh, the intensity of that work so you'd work basically 12 hour days I used to literally run to the bathroom because I didn't have uh, you had to be on your desk the whole time because there could be news about one of your stocks so I probably yeah. ate outside lunch outside for five hours you know five times in my in my 11 years so um, so work ethic first of all attention to detail I am mm. I have extreme attention to detail I really sweat the small stuff Sweat the small stuff the big stuff look that looks after it's themselves itself so uh, I have a very strong attention to detail and trading is all about attention to detail because it's like, do they say buy 50,000 shares or 15,000, five, zero or one, five, yeah. because it could be a major million dollar error if you get that wrong. So uh, really sweating the small stuff. And then um, I've, I'm a big believer in just doing everything, no matter how menial to the best of your ability always. Um, and so, you know, working, working my way up at, um, at Goldman, I always, no matter what the task was, I did put my best foot forward, even if in inverted commas, anything was beneath me. I don't believe in stuff being beneath you. And so I, on my first review there, I got told you're the sort of person that doesn't need to be asked twice to do something. Yeah. And I tell all young people in their career, be that person, because yeah. if you are the person that doesn't need to be asked twice or chased to do something, then you are already ahead of 99% of people. Like it, like it. Um, so what made you after uh, nearly 11 years in that world? Um, and look, we all know uh, how Goldman Sachs act every year with uh, people uh, leaving. Um, 
you've obviously done really well there just by the fact that you've been there for so long off the back of that you would have been earning an incredible amount of money um what what made you suddenly think I don't want to do this anymore yeah, so I, I mean, I absolutely loved my time at Goldman and I'm still a huge fan of the company and I have great friends, I have lifelong friends from there. Um, but I think when I left Goldman, I was there on the, I was there longer than something like 98% of the population. Like most people yeah. do the last 11 years at Goldman. Yeah. I remember being 27 and someone saying, oh, you're part of the furniture. And I was like, <laughs> 27, I can't really be, but, but it is. So I absolutely loved it. It was the best possible grounding in life. But I think there comes a point like I, I was tired. I was I, I felt burnt out. And I also I'd gone through some difficult personal circumstances. I had had a health issue. I had gone through a divorce. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the the thing about trading is as well, it feels like if you ever get you know that feeling where you, you think you, you've just almost stepped in front of a car and your heart leaps. Yeah. Like that happens multiple times a day when you're trading, right? Because if you, you can do the, the, the chance of you doing something wrong and the implications of it are so high. And when I was trading, I was trading us financials during the financial crisis. Like yeah. imagine yeah. that like the, it was absolutely wild volatility and the pressure was insane. And I love and thrive on pressure, but I also um, ultimately it just, I just started to feel a bit burnt out and it was yeah. taking its toll on my health. And I was like, okay, I wanted to move home to Ireland yeah. I wanted a fresh start and I I really wanted, I saw my, my two brothers work in technology. They work for Google and Facebook, nice. uh, as it's called nowadays. Um, and so I saw that they loved their jobs and I wanted to work for a growth business because fi financial services was shrinking, right? They were cutting yeah. heads all the time. Margins were shrinking. I wanted to go into an area that was growing. And also while I was within Goldman, I actually always looked for the new parts. So like I looked for, you know, what was the new area of development like going? So I moved desks a few, three or four times throughout those five, those 11 years. Nice. Um, so um, rolling forward um, to where we are today and where we want to spend the the, the base of the uh, the conversation here. Um, so you, you were the, the first person on the ground in Europe for, for Gong. Um, tell me what what made you, I guess they probably approached you for that position based on looking at your, your credentials, who you are. When, when that, that door knocked, what made you buy into what they were looking to, um, to try and do and the opportunity to come on board with them? Yeah, so for fear of sounding uh, slightly arrogant, I when you're senior and female in tech in the tech world, um, you get a lot of approaches. So I get a lot of approaches to people. I always am grateful to get them. I say thank you, but yeah. no thank you. And here's people I think you should talk to. So I try and do that. But when Gong came along, for some reason, I was sitting on it and I didn't say no and it was in my head and, I, and I'd never seen the product. I'd heard the name, but I didn't totally know what they did. But it just uh, ser serendipity intervened. I was on an exec women in leadership course. Um, I'm very lucky to have an incredible mentor who is the CEO of HubSpot now. We met yeah. at Dropbox, uh, Yamini Rangan. And I was on exec women in leadership course with her. And I just happened to mention to her that I was getting approaches from Gong. They were being persistent. And she said, it's a great company. You should take the call. Um, so I did. And I literally took the, I, I told my boss at Car Gurus before I took the first call because I said, look, because I was really happy at Car Gurus. I was like, yeah. this is, you know, I was well paid. I work for people that I loved. Uh, I really enjoy my job. I enjoy my team. Yeah. I was like, what's wrong with me? Why would I consider this? But basically it was, it was something that I thought, okay, well, I, I'll be upfront and honest about it. I, I said, I'll let you know if it's something I'm interested in. So I think I did the first interview on the 3rd of March and the final interview on the 17th of March. And they offered me the job like three days later. And for me, it was a few different things. First of all, the opportunity to be the first person on the ground uh, in EMEA is, is special for yeah. anything. Secondly, when I saw the technology, I was like, this is insane. I had no idea that this existed. And I am the buyer persona. So yeah. when I looked at it, I was like, I, I described it as technology as once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. So I thought it was completely game changing. And then the third thing was um, the uh, the caliber of the leadership team. When I met them, I just really liked them. There's that Gong has this, you know, I, I describe myself, I'm slightly wacky and eccentric and Gong has this tongue in cheek attitude as well, um, which I love and it fits with me. Uh, and the leadership team is like that as well. And then of course we have insane investors. We have, you know, yeah. the top investors. So there was a lot of things that came together, but it was a huge decision to walk away from Car Gurus because I was truly happy there. So you, you, you hit the nail on that head in what you were talking about there as to as to why you know i've been driving um this summer campaign of talking to sales enablements um you're right where you were before is is an organization that would be a customer of gong but you had no idea that that product um even existed um so in this is probably a good part to to say like what did gong do 
Yeah. What, what product are you offering people? Okay. So Gong is a revenue intelligence platform. So the way it works is we capture all interactions between your people and mm -hmm. your prospects, your customers. So through email, phone, web conference, uh, we integrate with over a hundred different applications and we use our artificial intelligence to pull out insights mm -hmm. into uh, three key areas. So one, what are your uh, people, your top people? What are your top sales reps doing differently? Two, with your, uh, what are your customers uh, or your prospects saying about your competitors? I give market, market intel and three deals. Where is the risk in your deal pipeline? How can you get ahead of the risks in your pipeline before it's too late and before it becomes a lagging indicator in the CRM? And the way historically this has worked is like, and the reason Gong came about was our CEO went through the quarter from hell and yeah. he he did, he basically churn spite, um, renewals fell off a cliff, new business fell off a cliff. And so he's trying to figure out what was going on. And so he went and he does what most people do, which is look at the CRM. But the problem is the CRM shows outputs. It shows lag, it's a lagging indicator. It shows the results. It doesn't show the context behind the results. Yeah. And so then he went and he did what we all do, which is go and ask people on the front line, like, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? But you ask 10 different people and you get 10 different answers. Yeah. And so he's like, there has to be a better way. And so the premise of Gong is it unlocks the black box between yeah. frontline conversations and gives visibility into what's truly going on in your business at scale and gives you actionable insights so you can address risk and the likes of a risk in your pipeline before it's too late. So it's, it's so powerful and there's so many different use cases for it. But honestly, in this macro climate, there's a, a bigger need than ever for this sort of product. And that's yeah. the beauty of it. Let's get into the, the detail of that then. Um, how, in the, in the role that you had at um, Car Gurus, how would this product have helped you if you'd had it there? Yeah. So I'll give you one example. So when I was at Car Gurus, we acquired another company mm -hmm. and uh, a Piston Heads. And so acquiring a company and integrating a company is a huge element of change management about it. And so what we did is we took people off the floor and mm -hmm. we put them in a room for two or three days and we trained them on the new messaging, you know, the value proposition of the combined entities. And then we sort of released them in the wild to sell and, and to sell. And the reality is that uh, I think one person from the off was really successful and the, the results from the others were underwhelming. What is she doing differently? Yeah. Um, and so she's so good. She doesn't know what she's doing differently, but I'd spend my life trying to jump on a call to listen to her, to understand how she's positioning it. And then it's just, it was so insanely inefficient. Yeah. And so, and so what happened was I didn't have any idea how many of the other reps had adopted the new talk track and in what percentage of their calls they were using it. So in a world where I would have had gone, I would have, having taken these people off the floor away from selling for two or three days, three, two or three days, I would have been able to, to measure and track exactly what percentage of reps have adopted the new talk track. Yeah. I would have heard the voice of the customer and would have been able to track that to outcomes to successful closed one. So understood which part of the messaging is landing and which isn't. We could reiterate the messaging and we could train the reps to yeah. actually to tweak their message to land like the person who is most successful. Yeah. So if you think about that and like the amount of acquisitions that get done and fail and so much of it is and any training, like, you know, you see people take people off the floor, train on Sandler, medic, whatever it is. How do you have any idea if they walk out of that room and input yeah. uh, and uh, put into practice anything that they've learned? Yeah. And, and honestly, there's there's data to say that 80 percent of what is of what they're trained on is lost after one month. So if you don't reiterate it and track it through through a platform like ours where we can use trackers. So if they've changed their behavior or not. It's just wasted money. How do you see a sales leader's role as in their day-to-day -day changing if you've got a product like this? So for instance, how long do you spend um, listening to calls? Yeah. Well, I think one of the best compliments I can give Gong is that I live in it because I am completely technically inept. <laughs> so don't tell anyone, but uh, <laughs> I'm very stupid at uh, generally learning new tech tools. So the fact that I got into it and like I'm obsessed yeah. with it, it's a good sign. So first of all, um, it helps. One thing VPs of sales don't have a lot of is time. Yeah. So I lis listen to Gong calls when I'm walking my dog yeah. or when I'm in the car. And I listen to things that I want to know. Like I know, for example, so many VPs of sales have to jump in on bigger deals 
and help the reps or whatever else. Like, how could I get up to normally I'd run around asking the rep to update me to, to fill me with info. I'd have to debrief beforehand. Whereas I can just listen to the last call quickly on Gong as I'm walking my dog, or I can go into the in the in our in our deal dashboard, I can see all of the correspondence uh, yeah. in that. So I'm already upskilled way quicker than I would have been otherwise. And the second part, so that's around the call piece. And the second part is around um the deal dashboard, like I live in the deal dashboard. I used to spend hours on forecasting in previous yeah. jobs. Um, and the because I'd be chasing information the whole time. And at the end of the day, you're just listening to subjective opinions from reps, right? They will always tell you what you want to hear. They have yeah. happy ears and you know a lot, and they it's never really bad intent. They want to believe it, they probably believe it themselves. Yeah. So you go, but when I look at Gong, Gong will tell me if there is if this deal is in commit, but we haven't discussed pricing and it's meant to close yeah. in a week. If we're not at power, if we don't have a VP or we don't have a decision maker involved in the process, they will tell me if the prospect is ghosting us. And if it's if it's like, okay, you're saying the deal's going to close in two weeks, but actually they haven't spoken to us for 30 days. Like, what are you talking about? So it shows all these early warning signals, which just makes my forecasting so like it's so much easier. It's literally a few yeah. clicks. And so there, I don't think there's any VP of sales on the planet who wouldn't see that as incredibly powerful and game-changing. Is it and because as you can you can um, imagine in uh, in my role in recruitment, I'm talking to to VP um, of sales and CROs um, every day, and I usually challenge them back when they say I don't have time, um, and I say, well, you'll normally prioritise what you think is important, and you know you can be very busy doing things that you don't necessarily need to do, and by listening to calls, you can make some certain tweaks, um, which can be um, game changing. In terms of who Gong is for, I have lots of conversations with people where they say these types of technology, they're really good for kind of mid-market SDRs, um, but not enterprise sales because of the, the length of time and how it all works. How would you respond to that? Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, that's an objection that we do come up against. And my first response is I have yet to meet an enterprise sales rep with an infinite memory. So yeah. uh, the point about enterprise sales cycles are they're, they are long. And so how have you any idea what, the, how do you remember what all the conversations are with previous different stakeholders when you're multi-threaded, it's even more complex. It's like not capturing that data is insane, right? It's so powerful. And the best sales reps, we see a strong, strong, strong correlation in our business between the, the people who listen to the reps who listen to the most calls are also the most successful. So when you're an enterprise sales rep, part of the problem with enterprise reps is that they don't actually get enough deals, right? So they don't get it, they don't get to hone their craft enough and their yeah. ramp times and everything are long. But imagine having access to being able to hear what the top reps have done and being able to upskill that quickly. Yeah. Um, and then also, what about the the access you give SDRs or corporate sales reps or mid-market sales reps to be able to hear enterprise rep calls? Think about the power of that knowledge sharing and learning. And then, as I said before, I'm a, if I'm a VP jumping on an enterprise deal, how do I get up to speed on it most efficiently and truly understand what's happening? It's yeah. like I have access to all of the information at the touch of a button. I think when you talk it through, then they get it. But also, you know what? It's like I would challenge VPs of sales if they have old school, in inverted commas, yeah. sellers who want to do things their way. Well, guess what? The world's changed. And like technology is here. It's making us all more efficient. It's making us better. And you should push. If your people don't want to improve and they think they've got it all figured out, well, that's a major red flag. Yeah. it's uh, and, and I guess also the the way like a lot of people will spoke about, particularly pre-COVID, that enterprise deals would have been done over coffees, dinners and whatnot. And you can't capture that. The, the world has moved to how we're talking right now. And, you know, I was, I was talking to um, an enterprise sales guy in the um, ETRM world. So he's selling big $5 million um, deals. He's not visiting clients now until they're about 95% qualified um, in where they are. Um, so there's a, there's a, the, the way deals are being done are changing there's a way that you can capture stuff and it's becoming much more processed, which I also think can actually make deal times be um, shorter mm -hmm. uh, because of, of everything that's going on and the information and the data that you can capture. But I think, the, you know, you, you spoke about the old the, the old school way, I think is the biggest kind of blocker on um, this being rolled out across the um, the enterprise space, because I really think the enterprise space is where they could really 
learn and really get have a, have an impact on this this type of um, uh, technology. Um, where's your view on? I've started saying, I, and, and I, 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 I'm on a mission to try and get um, VP of sales title changed to sales coach, um, because a lot of people see it as a VP of sales as a is a basically you're, that you're there to build revenue, um, hire in, but you get a revenue targets where it isn't. And I'm like, you're actually there to coach a team um, to be able to the, the the revenue is a byproduct of of where you are. And, and I think over 50% of sales leaders don't do the coaching bit to, to the level. And normally because they don't have the um, data to, to give them to show where they are. And it is kind of like, we'll get medic in to, to do some training sessions. Sam, they can come in and, and do some bits and pieces. But what's your view on exactly how much coaching a sales leader should be doing? Well, I think, you know, especially if I look at like frontline sales leaders, like they're the busiest people in the business often because they, you know, demands from below, demands from above. And I think that coaching is often the thing that goes by the wayside. What the visibility of our platform gives, it shows who they've spent time with, how many calls they've listened to, how many yeah. calls they've commented on and given feedback on. Um, and you can sh show literally how they're spending their time, right? And it's like, so... It is is the sort of thing like you get what you inspect. Like if you don't inspect that, like it, it's and it's one of the single biggest levers that can actually move the move the dial. So you know, like over fifty percent of sales reps miss quota every single quarter on yeah. average. And so, well, how can you change that? And and it's like if you don't know where people are spending their time and you can't address it, then uh, then that's they're not going to they're not going to prioritize it. Yeah. And I would say personally as well, like I do, I listen to calls. I love listening to calls. Um, and you know, I will make comments to the reps directly or to uh, the manager or to the rep directly as well because I am the buyer persona. We sell to VPs of sales. Yeah. So I share how I'm thinking. Like for example, I gave a macroeconomic presentation um, back to you know CRO, CRO network about uh, six weeks ago. And I shared the presentation and deck and a recording of me giving it to my team so they understand what are the problems we yeah. uh, how to position things and shared a you know shared a doc of these are the sort of questions you should be asking because if I put want to put myself in their shoes and I also don't like asking anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself yeah. so it's important to lead from the front and also show, share your own vulnerability like my calls are recorded yeah. and you know I it's like it, we all make mistakes some, yeah. some some of them are good some of them are bad it's, it's just it is what it is right so. Um, but there's uh, no we have a leadership principle at Gong which is no royalty which I love yeah. which is that, you know we're we're not special just because I have a VP title I'm not special we're all in it together and so, so you mentioned there about pressures from above pressures from below demands um, on information if you have Gong though with some of the information that you have there how much time do you actually get back because um you know, I'm guessing that you've got leaders under underneath you, which are looking after people, whereas you can log onto a platform and look at stuff, whereas before you'd have to phone up and say, mm -hmm. where's this at? Where's that at? Talk yeah. me from this. But they've actually can just log on and visualize everything that they need to know. I mean, honestly, it's insane. Like it's the type of thing that our product is so good that we have had two VPs of sales get it written into their contracts when they move jobs that the company they were going to was had to buy gone. As you said, VP sales have no time. Time is the one thing we don't have, but it makes you so so much more efficient. Yeah. And so as a practical example of it, like I used to spend hours forecasting and, and the way I would do that is I'd run around and I'd ping reps and I'd ping managers and I'd try to get information on top deals and try and piece it all together and figure, figure it out. I have that information at, at literally at my fingertips a few weeks. I don't have to go and ask the rep what's yeah. the latest of this deal because I can see it myself in a really easy to digest manner. I see warnings as well. It's not like I have to go and read a transcript. Yeah. I literally get warned if there's a problem with the deal. And so we've actually just released a forecasting product ourselves. Yeah. And, um, and a practical example of how it works is if, a, if there's a 100K deal in commit in my forecast, yeah. and if my rep receives an email or has a phone conversation or a web conference, whatever, for that with that customer, and they say, you know what, um, we are we've now just decided to trial another competitor. And so this is going to be pushed to next quarter. I know straight away that 100K of my pipeline has, of my commit has fallen out and I need to find backfill it, right? That's, or is that risk? In that same situation, every single other forecasting tool out there would say, brilliant, you got an email from the prospect. So this is great. It's activity-based. It's not based yeah. on the context. Yeah. So we are the only 
only forecasting uh, tool that actually understands the context of the entire conversations, which is what makes it so incredibly powerful. Like, is this good news or bad news if you don't understand what's happening? And it's really complicated. Like we've, we have, we've been around since 2016. We have over half a billion interactions analyzed. Wow. So it's, this is really hard to do. We are really well positioned because the end of the day, there's no point in buying these products unless they give you actionable insights um, and people wouldn't stick with us unless we did. Absolutely. Um, so what's next for Gong? What, what, what do you plan to do? You've, you, you've hired a lot of people and I'll touch on how you went um, about that because that's an incredible amount of people to, to bring on uh, board, probably particularly during a pandemic as well. Um, but before we touch into that, what, what's next for Gong? Where are you going? What are the aspirations? What are you, what are you trying to achieve personally? Yeah, so, well, I mean, I'll just touch on it quickly. So on the product side, we, uh, mm. you know, I said we rolled out Gong Forecast. We have a, a product we are rolling out that's in beta currently called Gong Assist as well. And again, this is to reduce the mundane tasks that reps hate. Like so much of a rep's time is spent wasted on like mundane tasks that they hate doing and they don't do it properly. And so the way Gong Assist works is it will, uh, when you, it don't, because we understand the context of the conversation, after the conversation has happened, it will pre-populate an email with action items that you said you would do. You said you'll send a copy of the call or you yeah. said you'll send the pricing sheet. And so it's reducing the, uh, the, those mundane tasks so reps can spend time on what's most important, which is selling. So um, Gong is this, and, and another quick example of that is if you get if you send an email to a prospect and you get an out of office, Gong will alert you when your prospect is back in office because it knows based on the out of office message when the person's back in the office. So again, it's all about efficiency. And in this market, everyone needs more efficiency. So for Gong and Mia specifically, um, you know, we're at 65 heads hired right now. Uh, we have an office in Dublin, which is which is great. We people boots on the ground in the UK and in Dublin, where our headquarters are. We have been selling outbound to um, UK, Ireland and Israel. We will be expanding beyond that. We've just um, hired a first Dutch rep as well. We're expanding into Nordics, into Benelux nice. and then ultimately France and Germany as well. Um, but what's really encouraging is that we're already in 30 different countries in EMEA, despite having not sold outbound to them. So there's a huge inbound interest. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, so the, the goal for the hiring this year is to, to be over 100 by end of year. Yeah. Uh, so it's really also wonderful that we're still hiring in this climate because so many other people are not. And like, the, it's just, a, it's a very, very special story. And I feel incredibly lucky to be part of it. Excellent. Um, I said I wouldn't ask you any technical, difficult questions, um, but there's one that I have to ask. Um, where a lot of this conversational platform struggle in Europe is the languages, um, particularly you mentioned France there. France has been a big one of a, of, of a struggle. Where are you guys at with, um, with that and, and knowing that you, that you can get that language um, bit right? Yeah, so I mean, the nature of our product is it's language based as well. So, um, so we have an absolutely insanely amazing R and D team, um, which is based in Israel, and now we've just opened uh, uh, another engineering hub in Dublin, which makes me very exciting. So we have our engineering and DTM team sitting beside each other in Dublin, which is brilliant. But you know, Gong takes this very seriously. So we have, we already have UK, we have English in house, and um, we have German, German in house. Um, Spanish and French will be roll, likely rolled out in the next uh, few months. So, um, so we are prioritizing. There's a localization list of uh, which we're prioritizing in terms of language. It's something that, like we know, it's of, of prime importance and it things. But but localization is a big word, right? So most companies um, use off the shelf, use Google or Amazon um, as uh, you know their their vendors of, of choice. We know our word error rate is um, is actually, which is how it's kind of measured, is actually better than those because it's business related, right? It's like it's not like hey Siri, it's like it's business related. So yeah, so but localization is a huge piece of work. So it think, involves like, do you localize the UI? Do you you know do you all the the materials and, and that you need for customers? That is and, and it's a work in progress, right? Nothing happens overnight. Um, but I personally am very encouraged by the amount of resources that Gong has allocated to international. We see it as a huge opportunity. And um, it's something that it's one of the top three company priorities for the year. And I have, you know, had our co-founder, Elon, was in town yesterday. So uh, we have direct access to um, to sort of the, the priorities and making sure that EMEA is represented within them. So, so yeah. Right. So who, who should be buying Gong? Uh, should a, a pre-seed um, organization be investing in Gong? Is it 
past Series A funding? Is it done on a revenue number, a headcount? Who's your buyer persona? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, and the beauty of Gong is that at the time is enormous because it really, it's, so basically we have a minimum three seat. So yeah. we say you need to have at least three sellers to make it worthwhile. But the reason so many people, we have so many cu uh, customers that are really early stage, is Series A, Series B, uh, because they want to understand, imagine how powerful it is when you're setting up a business to understand this is what's working and this is what's not working. And this is what my top rep is doing. And so when I bring people on, I'm going to be able to train them on what my top rep is doing. Yeah. Think about how powerful that is when you're scaling a business and growing rapidly. And the whole nature of the product as well is that um, we help people onboard. We reduce the time to productivity because people have access to this so that they're able to onboard quicker. Um, so first of all, on that end of it, there is the, the, but all the way we run the gamut, all we have major enterprises as customers as well. You know, LinkedIn's a customer, HubSpot's a customer. The, yeah. We have, we have big businesses on board and it's, it's because there is no business that doesn't need to understand what's happening on the front line between their, their people and their prospects or their customers. Like every single business wants to unlock that black box. Our biggest challenge is people just don't know this technology exists. Yep. You know, there's more awareness about it in the US, revenue intelligence. And we've seen a number of people move into the space as well, which is really validating it. And Gartner says that by 2025, 70% of all B2B buyer-seller interactions will be reported. So it's like the world is evolving rapidly. The other thing that people get wrong is they think it's just for sales reps. Yeah. But I think it's our stat is like something like at 40 to 50% of the people on our platform are sales. The rest yeah. makes your customer success, it's marketing, it's product, because it's so powerful. Who doesn't want to hear the voice of the customer? Yeah. And it means that there's alignment amongst those drifting segments internally when they use it. Yeah. There's 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 also um, uh, part of touch on which um, I think it would be useful, particularly around the forecasting um, tool, is around funding and being able to... A, for VC to actually be able to get proper detail on what a business is able to scale to um, with the information that's that's in there. And it might help kind of scale back some of the huge amount of funding that goes in because obviously with the amount of funding that goes in, revenue targets will normally always go up. But, the, the you know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard, like, and I don't want to sort of like um, dampen a, a founder and when they've, they've just got some extra funding where they you know they were looking to get 10 million and walked away with 30 million um and they're like you know it's like this is brilliant and i was like yeah but you were looking for 10 million and the valuation of what you were able to do for what you perceived you could do as revenue was against the 10 million it doesn't change because you go 30 all you do is uh, we'll have more people and um, because we've got more people and that's where it doesn't really work but i really see that that forecasting bit to be to, to really help VPs of sales around funding and, and getting accurate valuations on what a business can do and getting the right amount of funding. Do you see that as, as an important part or, or, or a metric that could be of interest? Absolutely. But I, I think, you know, and we, I touched on this, we touched on this earlier, but I think people just assume like extra heads, throw more heads out of, throw more bumps and seats and yeah. will make you more productive and make you more efficient. And at the end of the day, if you don't have the right tech stack and you are not keeping up with trends and pace of this, the speed of artificial intelligence and how you can run your business better, it's a gap. It's a significant gap um, if, you, if you don't equip your teams to be successful. Yeah. And, and, you know, the beauty of a product like ours is people, we call them raving fans, or we have our people who use our product are obsessed with it. Yeah. So it's like, make sure you get the balance right of the technology you use to support your team so that they can be as successful as they can be because they're running blind otherwise. Um, yeah. And so uh, so I think it's the, the trade-offs between who you hire, when you hire, and what um, tech, you know, what sort of technology you buy it should be looked at. Interesting. Um, so look, I, I've kept you on uh, for a little while, but before I, um, I let you go, a um, huge amount of hiring um, that's, uh, that's gone on. Um, where did you even start um, after after you arrived to being at, at 60, uh, 60 plus people today? 
Well, when I got the job, I started calling people I know to see if I could hire them. So people who, who I didn't work with at my current firm, so past people. And I managed to hire um, quickly five people who I'd worked with at various different firms before. And um, because I think it's really important for any founding landing member of a team to, to utilize their network. And yeah. um, one thing we got wrong is we didn't bring on a recruiter, local recruiter quickly enough. We had to use our US recruiting team who are amazing, but you yeah. need someone who understands the local market. So I would advise people that if they are launching to hire hire the recruiter at the same time as they hire the, the head of a me or head of VP sales, whatever. But then, you know, I just sort of started doing a, I joke about selling my soul on LinkedIn. <laughs> it's like yeah. trying to build a brand and reach yeah. it, you know, doing things like these, these podcasts and uh, various different events and just real, building the brand awareness, employer brand awareness. So uh, it's critically important. And it really helps that our, our product is used by a lot of the major tech firms, um, yeah. certainly in Dublin. So people are familiar with it. So, I, I am bombarded on LinkedIn by people who want to work for Gong, which is an absolutely beautiful problem to have. And some of them are often our prospects or our customers. So it tends to be tricky. So I have to find yeah. that right balance. Yeah, I bet. Um, so a lot of, um, when I talk about uh, to sales leaders um, about challenges and things they would, they would they would like to improve, getting hiring right more often is um, is big up there for them. I, I and, and just to caveat that, I, I kind of think that, um, sales leaders get hiring right more often than they think what they get wrong is onboarding that first 12 months is really critical and they think if they just um, get through the first month they'll be all right um but but you've managed to to, to scale to a um an incredible size over a, you know a, a short period is there anything that you do in the process anything in the interview that, that you've learned over time um i'm particularly probably thinking there's something to do with attention to detail um, bits that you've got in there but is there anything that you have um, that you use that you would share to the audience about hiring and your strategy so there's a great book um, that I love on this which my old CEO at Cargurus Jason Trevison gave me which is called who question mark by I think it's Randy Street and Jeff Smart yes. um, and I really like that and what it does is essentially it's, it's really it's, it's not rocket science it's chronologically understanding why people have made the decisions they have um, how their boss would what they their their old bosses would say about them in terms of strengths and areas for development, and what I'm looking for within that is I'm looking for accountability. I want humility and accountability because no yeah. one's perfect, and we've all made mistakes, and we learn along the way. That sort of methodology has helped me um, understand because uh, you can generally you understand if there's gaps in people's CVs, if there's they left under dubious circumstances. Yeah. It reduce it has I believe reduced the the risk in hiring. There's always risk in hiring. And then the second thing is about onboarding is at the end of the day, our product is, is made for onboarding. So yeah. how, how can you help people ramp quickly? Well, give them access to what the top sales reps in the company are doing, are doing so that they can learn best practice from the off. So, uh, so, so we have the, both of those things, I would say, I think has put us in, in a really good place. And how have you, um, cause I guess you've done it in a couple of, of places there is what you talk about there is, is really great and, and probably helps you hire the first 20 people then you've got other people doing the hiring for you how do you empower that logic into the people who are then doing it because I guess in you've not got time to interview everybody that's coming through I don't know whether you do a final stage or a conversation in play but by the time I guess you're talking to them you want to make sure those characteristics and things have already been found out so how do you how do you empower that so, well, well, two things. So first of all, I am on every interview. So if it makes it, to, so because I believe, you know, the foundation gong one day will be probably thousands of people in EMEA and, and uh, it's my job to make sure that the first 100 is anyway, it's my yeah. job to make sure they're all correct, but ultimately yeah. it's, getting, it's my number one priority to get the, these people right. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the leadership team I've hired have displayed all of the traits and attributes that I want, right? So they they characterize them, they believe in them. They have the same humility, accountability, drive, resilience. So they they live that and that's who they are. They look for that automatically. I, I, I absolutely trust that they have the same high standard of expectations that I do. And, um, and you know, if at the end of the day, an interview is a moment in time. So yeah. somebody, you know, I've hired people who've done great interviews and turned out to be terrible, or, or sometimes I've hired people who did terrible interviews who turned out to be great because other people believed in them. So um, so it's, it, it, it is a, it, it's not an exact science. Um, but I, I think on balance, like at the end of the day, if I had, 
three or four people on a panel and they love someone and I don't it's like I will always trust their decision because I can be wrong clearly I can be wrong so um so you know we have a discussion about it and it's not a it's it's definitely not dictatorship it's it's meant to be I trust them I empower them to make decisions and um and they do a superb job of it excellent um and how much hiring are you planning to do uh next year uh, well, I'm actually going off to Israel in a week to do uh, fiscal year 24 planning because our fiscal yeah. this is our fiscal year 23 because we end in January. So it's yeah. so confusing. I don't know what year I'm in. So uh, so all those headcount discussions are part of it. But look, it's it almost certainly will be 50 plus and, uh, you know, it could be a lot more. So we'll see where we go um, from there. But uh, but yeah, but the team has put me in a great position to go and bat for more headcount because they've been killing their numbers this year. So I'm very grateful. to them. Awesome. Um, well, Wendy, I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to us. I think the, the audience are going to uh, get a lot from that. Um, if someone's listeners wants to get in touch, I don't know whether you want to be inundated with people asking questions or if there's there's somewhere you want to point them towards. But if, if people are listening to that going, uh, right, I need to know more, what's the best thing for them to do? Yeah, I would say follow Gong on LinkedIn, follow uh, follow me on LinkedIn, connect me on LinkedIn. And um, I would also encourage to look at our gong.io gong.io forward slash careers homepage, because that's where you'll see all the latest jobs. So I often get asked, could you jump on a quick call or have a coffee? And I unfortunately <laughs> just I just can't. I always feel so bad because it's 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 just yeah. but it's just time. So uh, but that is the best place to find out what's happening and, and feel free to apply directly. Awesome. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. I'll let you get back to, uh, to your day now. Brilliant. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, James. Really appreciate it.